to the virtual premiere of The Gauntlet. I had the fascinating pleasure of being interviewed by Coco for this new work last June. The interview was unlike any other I have experienced, given the expectation that I should be in a constant state of movement. I remember being highly conscious of my movements at the beginning, more so than of what I was saying in response to Coco's thoughtful questions. But with her gentle suggestions of what would suffice as movement and not to worry about having to create some kind of fantastic dance, I relaxed and I soon found it liberating not to have to sit still for the camera as you usually have to for an interview. So in the span of about 20, 30 minutes, I really got used to liking the format. I had of course already become very used to doing online meetings. And so it was poignant to have an interview in which I could feel myself physically occupying space at a time when we were, and indeed still are, physically disconnected, but virtually connected, working at home, which sometimes feels more like living at work. Afterward, I took to moving around during Zoom meetings more often, and I do it now all the time, turning off my camera, but still able to engage when I feel I need a little movement. Almost a year later now, I am delighted to hear Skip and Coco's work come to life through their innovative collaboration with the dedicated and talented choir, our Art Center team, and all the MYUED faculty, staff, and students who contributed to these interviews. Together, they have made this piece into what it is. And I think that the words innovation and collaboration are crucial here. In this challenging time that will continue a while longer, a studio environment that would normally be in one place will spread across the world in all these different locations with choral recordings from Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, and Poland, production from New York, and choral direction from the UK, and with what I hear is an innovative sound design technology. Apparently, Zoom was involved, and so I am sure that these producers had to grapple with the familiar challenges we all have come to know, delayed sound, unstable internet, and above all, forgetting to unmute. But this community came together to forge ahead with a production that had been planned in person, but overcame distance to achieve connection, communication, and true excellence. There is no more poignant example, I believe, of the incredible resilience and creativity that we have witnessed these past 12 months, and how creativity and resilience actually stand in a very interesting interaction to each other. So I am proud to have been a tiny part of this great work. And I want to thank all of those who have made it happen and wish you a very enjoyable performance. Welcome to the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi and the world premiere of Skip Shari and Coco Carroll's The Gauntlet, Far Away Together. I'm Bill Bragan, Executive Artistic Director of the Art Center. I want to start by thanking Vice Chancellor Marriott Westerman for that moving and really resonant introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to hear that your participation in the interviews actually influenced your work process, and I can't wait for you to hear the piece. Marriott has been extraordinarily supportive of the Art Center, originally helping to set the public programming mandate for the university in her original role as the, as the founding provost. Now in her role as vice chancellor, we're constantly gratified by her presence in our audiences, her championing of the programs in university-wide forums and in her social media feed, by her work to generate support for the Art Center in the UAE community, and in tonight's case, her willingness to participate in the creative process by engaging in the movement interviews, which were transformed into the text for the libretto. I also wanna give a huge thanks to the staff of the Art Center for all their efforts to reinvent what we do as an online performing art center. This past year has required us to constantly explore new and unknown approaches. And tonight's program especially reflects everyone's willingness and more importantly, their talent in taking on new artistic and technical challenges. And lastly, I wanna thank the Art Center's sustaining sponsor, GAC, as well as our media partners, the National al Dahad, Abu Dhabi World, Yellow Magazines, and Time Out Abu Dhabi. We've got two events coming up in the next week. First, on Monday, April 5th, Manifold, a festival of musical diversity presented in partnership with the NYUED music program, continues with new sounds for 2021. 
This is a filmed concert featuring classical instruments, dance, and video manipulation to create a one-of-a-kind multimedia experience performed by Christina Iwan, Amil Sain, Kiori Kawai, Aaron Sherwood, and Bettina Schober. And among the works premiering that night are a new work by NYU Abu Dhabi alumnus Cristobal Morian. Next Wednesday, April 7th, we open a five-night run of Theater for One, Here We Are which features a collection of short micro plays created and performed by some of the theater world's most notable writers, directors, and actors, each performed online for a live audience of just one person. Theater for One, Here We Are is inspired by the pandemic, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment in the US, Black Lives Matter, We See You One American Theater, and other movements fighting racism. Tickets are available now, and as you can imagine, you should book soon. To get all the details, please visit nyuad-artcenter.org on the web, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter, as well as help support the Arts Center's work by becoming a member. You can also get news by following at NYUAD Art Center and social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you can find live streams and archival events, including tonight's program. Finally, we have a large number of partners who are collaborating with the Arts Center to bring tonight's program to the world. So I want to specifically thank Afikra, a great online uh, speaker and conversation series, Special Olympics UAE, Blank Canvas, the US Mission to the UAE, Women Between Arts, as well as a number of NYU Abu Dhabi departments, the Office of Equity and Inclusion, the Office of Social Responsibility, the Office of Global Education, and the Office of the Vice Chancellor. And with that, it's my pleasure to welcome to the screen, Skip Shari and Coco Carroll, the co-creators of the gauntlet far away together. Hello, Skip and Coco, welcome. Hello. 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 I'm going to let people at some point later hit the download link uh, where they can get the program. They can, learn a lot, they can learn a lot more about both of you and your history. Uh, but what I want to do now is have a few minutes of conversation just to set the stage before we let everybody listen to the program. Uh, I'm also going to remind people right now that for the immersive 3D spatialized sound to have the most effect, Closed back headphones are best, so go run and get them if you don't already have them with you. Otherwise, I definitely recommend earbuds rather than listening through speakers so that you, re you can really understand the artistic intention. Uh, and we'll remind you again later to get your headphones. But I wanna start uh, with the first basic question. What is the gauntlet? Uh, I know we've talked about the gauntlet is both a musical form and a musical instrument. So I'm wondering if you could both just explain what the gauntlet is and how it usually works as an in-person event. And as an in-person event, the gauntlet is a, an immersive choir that the conductor plays. Uh, it's called the gauntlet because it's a gauntlet of singers. It is a choir facing a choir in a hallway. We, we do other formations as well. We do labyrinths, we do circle gauntlets, but the basic form is a choir on stools facing the, facing each other, and the audience walks upstream as the conductor passes tones to the, to the singer to the left and to the right, and they pass those tones downstream and across from each other. So instantly I can go and create chords and uh, uh, very close harmony. And I also can pass phrases, sung phrases like sing me a sing me uh, and, and close uh, uh, phrases in harmony. And so you're walking up stream of all these singers passing tones and phrases above your head. And then there's several uh, other techniques we use also like hocketing and uh, holding, holding, t holding tones of simple melodies. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple and complex art form at the same time. It's a relationship. And uh, it, we also say it collapses the choir back into individuals because you really, with a choir, you don't hear the people singing as individuals, but in this, you really hear them communicating with each other as individuals. So that's, I think that's a simple way to cut, to try to explain it. Right, and then Coco, um, if you could, as a yeah. Form, yeah, as a form, um, we call it community inclusive theater because, um, the way that we we do it within a community is we come into a community and I do these movement interviews and then uh, we create the libretto from those movement interviews and so as you're walking upstream of the form yeah. you're hearing um, people people's personal narratives or fragments of stories and this kind of poetic resonance of like how we make meaning of our experience and so as a form what we found is that it, it's a very powerful tool for um, 
also how to engage with community and um, and how to tell stories that would maybe otherwise um, be unsung. And a, and a real important part is the curation of who Coco is going to interview. In this case, it was it was you, Bill, and you gave us amazing people. And we really mm -hmm. asked that we want all levels of society. So in Sydney, she interviewed a, 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 a Im illegal immigrant. Uh, I don't know what the better term would be a in this refugee. case, refugee, but who had to stay underground, a uh, transgendered uh, person, and the and the deputy mayor, who is all about permaculture and, uh, and and environmental issues. So it's really we're really trying to, of course, as as the people involved, we our our, our viewpoint is in the piece, but we're really trying to take our viewpoint out of the piece and let the language uh, speak for itself. And in Abu Dhabi, I interviewed um, artists, um, mm. activists, change makers. Um, I interviewed you, Bill. I inter interviewed um, security guard. I interviewed a yeah. um, beautiful array of voices that you will hear this evening. Yeah. Great. And uh, I don't want to give too much away before we ask people to put on their headphones, which hopefully they run and got. But uh, is there, uh, I know in the, in the program note, you have some suggestions for embodied. Is he frozen? Um, I don't know if you're frozen or we're frozen, but um, yes, there are embodied movement suggestions in the program. And um, uh, mostly, um, mostly what I would say is um, there, there are poetic suggestions. Um, one of them is um, to find a place where you can be placeless. Um, and I think that that comes from this um, cultural moment that we're in of the global pandemic and everything um, being um, decentralized and everyone having this sense of placelessness. Um, and, uh, and so that's one of the embodied movement suggestions and it can be interpreted very liberally. Um, another thing that we found is um, like when I was listening throughout, like before, even after I wrote those suggestions, I found um, I just wanted to close my eyes. I wanted to be in the placeless place of my own sort of space. And, um, and so I invite you to close your eyes, open your eyes, be inside, be outside. Um, and, uh, um, and then, um, and to find, to feel, to feel an embodied sense because all of the language came from these movement interviews and they came from an embodied answer. And so um, I invite you all to find an embodied place to listen to um, the gauntlet and also to let your environment also come in. The, yeah, it's great um, if the sounds are, while we were composing this, occasionally uh, the sound of our child would come through and yeah. the sounds in your, in, your, in your environment become part of the piece too. Yeah. I think we are going to go uh, ahead to the audio of the piece. Is that right? Um, I think I see Bill coming back on. Yes, we're, we are having Zoom issues already. <laughs> but we can kill time until Bill. I'm, I'm back on a different device. If anybody can find me, can you hear me? Am I here? I, we can hear you. We can hear you, Bill. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of a perfect illustration of what can happen. Yeah. 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 Welcome back. Um, all right, so um, I think that it sounds like we were probably, you vamped for a while, I vamped for a while, people had time to go get their headphones, and uh, it's a great time to now uh, ask people to put on your headphones and uh, listen to the world premiere of the Gauntlet.
distinctive feeling that I am in my past, that I am in my future. Told myself I, I was. I flee the things that I once told myself I was. I flee the things that I once 
stood myself I was. I once stood myself I was. I feel the things that I once stood myself I was.
this one. I saw this one, a little child. His eyes haunted me. So I drew him and I painted him. When I finished, I felt like he became very real. So I started destroying the paint, but I kept the eyes. I kept the way he was looking out at me. And then, from a little boy, he became an old man. It's raining. This image keeps coming up from my childhood. Lots of things because I have been trying to do with my mother's long life. I used to find some dead and stay for an hour or two. I had my moments. The things I see in the contrast. Stories I hear in your country to wake up from the things I see every day. So I miss always my parents, my family. My life was completely changed. The life I was living in my country was a completely different life. And my life is a completely different life. I do live your life. Each step, stories are how it felt. I miss my culture. I miss my country. I miss my family. I miss my culture. I miss my country. I miss my family. I miss my culture. I miss my country. I miss my family. I miss my my culture, I miss my country, it's I miss my family, I miss What's my culture, in my head? I miss my country, is the feeling of my mother's long black hair brushing against my face, it's raining, stories are happening, what's in my head, is the feeling of my mother's long black hair brushing against my face, it's raining, stories are happening, the things that keep coming to my mind, 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 just walked out of his room. He's nine. People ask how old is your son? Eleven. Statistically, we know black children and Latinx are assumed to be older than they are. And so when they make innocent mistakes or do things that children do, they're evaluated as someone who's older. So a 12-year-old with a toy gun is. Here's a grown man with a gun. This absence of innocence is something to contend with. My son, it seems ridiculous to say. I wish I'd raise my son in a rougher neighborhood so that he'd be more prepared for the life he's going to live. It's not inaccurate. I, I always struggle with not knowing where I am from. My parents tell me where they're from, but I don't think it's true. I forget their people. My stuff comes from somewhere else. It's hard to find where I belong. I kind of got always trying to. I forget what I remember is looking in the mirror at my face. And I call the room. I must have been 11. Who is this? Who am I? It was frightening after that I the visual confrontation with their face and their eyes. Death, I was and then you had the screen in my face. face. My community. I look forward to this. I had to dress in my eyes. Me like and who is this? Oh, like who am I? This is it someone else. And who is this? Who am I? This is it someone else. And who is this? 
Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? This isn't someone else. Who is this? Who am I? It was frightening. The visual confrontation with her face, her eyes. I feel screen in my face. I lean forward a bit. I have stress in my eyes. It's a very sad story. Now we go home. We had a party. So I took her in for her with me. The word for human in Arabic is insan. It comes from the root word nausea, to forget. The human condition is a state of forgetting and remembering.
What would you give someone if you could give home? Home? What home? I would give this person a nest. An old growth forest. A city where the bars are filled with live music. Belonging without a passport. A cactus in bloom. An opera. Agency. A room emanating with laughter. Getting your flowers before you die. A painting with syncopated autumn colors. A salsa dance with my grandfather. A salsa dance with a stranger. I would give a gathering with friends. A place to recharge, a comfortable bed, a strong shower, and well-stocked bar. A pool, body floating in water, like flying in the sky. A moment of suspended judgment, a camera, friends. A chance to finish what you started. A chance to provide for your family. A chance to hold your children. Wow, uh, I just wanted to uh, let that sit for a moment. Uh, thank you so much, Skip and Coco, for that piece, for that gift. Uh, I've literally listened to this at least a dozen times in the past couple of days. And each time I listen, I find it even more moving and I find even more in the, in the piece that keeps revealing itself to me, uh, which is surprising because uh, We've been probably more involved in the creative process in this piece than almost any other uh, any other project we've worked on. I just checked back and just over the past five weeks, we had about 150 emails back and forth between us and the, both of you, just ideating and exploring and talking about the ideas. And still as close as we were to the creative process, uh, I was really surprised by, uh, by the form it took. So thank you. Uh, so I wanted to uh, I wanted to just frame it. Uh, this was originally scheduled to be an in-person event, uh, and I checked earlier. Uh, Skip and Coco were actually scheduled to leave New York to come to Abu Dhabi for the in-person premiere uh, and to start developing the piece and doing the interviews exactly one year ago from tomorrow on April first, twenty twenty. And in this process, we decided to keep going, uh, a whole lot of risk taking and a whole lot of embracing of not knowing where we'd be going, what it would do. So Skip and Coco, uh, I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about, about how this change changed your creative process and, and the impact this had on you as you worked on it. Ooh. Wow, sorry, I'm actually, this is the first time I've really listened to the piece not on a technical level, 
And uh, I definitely had, I had tears in my eyes <laughs> so a little bit, you know, it, it here's how it, the piece is so complex to do in, in a sort of, uh, it, it requires so much hands-on, like my hands, meaning editing was on every little vocal moment you heard. There's a big difference. Like when I'm doing the gauntlet, normally I enter into a society of singers and we do the piece and it kind of takes care of itself in a lot of ways. I, I guide it, but it's like, Hurting cats, it's like hurting the hurting the ocean. It's like trying to get streams of water to move in a certain direction. But in this one, like little 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 birds or little little plants that I was planting in a garden, I held each piece of sound. So suddenly I got to see the garden and it, it's it's really moving and it's yeah, I think yeah. that's actually I think what is also the difference in the creative process is we yeah. um we got to be much more intimate with yeah. um, the material because we had longer to do it over. And um, it's such an interesting um, dichotomy that our paradox that um, we have felt closer to some of the subjects and interview subjects and singers and you, Bill, and uh, yeah. Lindsay, and um, people at the Chris Art and Center Subin and Chris. And Claire. so we felt almost closer to the people working in this process than when we're actually live with people because there's been so much more um time and saturation and um um i think that's one of the biggest differences in our creative and i would process. say i always felt like i was failing the moving interviews that we that we got in the past were so intense and sometimes i'd use only could use one little bit of language so i always felt like i failed in a way that i wasn't honoring uh, the movement interviews in this case the movement interviews really got used to a new level because we just had more time with the process and we we're in a larger conversation. So it's up the bar. Mm -hmm. Like we had this down so we could do it in two weeks. It was a two week <laughs> process and now it won't be good enough for us or good enough for the community because ultimately if this really works in a way we disappear when it's done and it's mm -hmm. and it, it really is a, the, the voice of the community. So, and we're part of the instrument that the community plays. And I feel like it's happened here to a larger degree than ever before. Yeah, another important difference, I think, in like a, a virtual composition that you sit down and you hear from beginning to end is that there is a beginning, middle and end. And mm -hmm. there is a sense of, um, uh, of that. Whereas in a gauntlet that you would experience in a public place, um, you might enter then it's already been going on for an hour and you walk up the stream and you don't know what part you're going to be in so in in those compositions we're composing for the idea that like it's a constant beginning yeah. again begin again begin again and there's a kind of there is an ending but there isn't an ending also which um and both both things have uh, such um an important important resonance um for how um how a, a viewer will experience a work yeah. um and both are beautiful but this one is it's been been amazing to have like a beginning middle and an end <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i was at the very first gauntlet that you did at the high line and i mm. remember you walked through it and then you were invited to get to the back of the line and walk through it again so you just caught some fragments but i think the two the two differences for me is you know that the ephemerality is really different because now this piece exists. It's a yeah. composition. It's going to stay online, but also the intimacy, which I think these things, um, yeah. you know, it's it's in your head. It's surrounding you. You really, it's so physical, but it's also so intimate. Yeah. And the gauntlet, typically in the other versions, one of the aspects of it was the fact that it's public, that you're doing it in Rock and Roll Center, you're doing it in right. City Opera House, you're doing it at the Cleveland Museum, you're doing it in a huge open space in Norway, I forget where that was, but there's a publicness to that idea and now there's a privateness to it. I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about that experience. Well, it makes me wonder about whether, like each time we do a gauntlet, we discover something new and then we take it to the next gauntlet. And uh, also being inspired by uh, Theater for One, I'm like, oh, maybe there should be a single singer in a room. And that part of the gauntlet is, how do we create that intimacy uh, what we've learned here and bring it back to the public space. And but I would say hmm. um, that actually the gauntlet in public space very much foregrounds um, a private sense of intimacy, even in a huge public space, especially in large cities and things where like um, the intimacy of your own experience as 
you go through something. For instance, the singers are on stools, so they're elevated a little bit above you, giving you a sense of like childlike wonder. And you, as you walk through, you you are in this kind of very private space that's also very public at the same time, and um, and a sense of sharing it with others. Like everyone's having. Skip has this great saying that everyone's intimate experience is epic to them, and I think the gauntlet in public space. Um, is a very private experience that you go through publicly like or in a public space and this this time um i especially for this premiere like there's a sense of that there's a a, a deep sense of private space because you're with your headphones um and i was i was interested to see if it would still feel like a sense of sharing it with others and it does i mean it mm. does it felt like um like all alone together <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm going to I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to bring in some guests and then we'll keep circling back and explore different parts of it and then bring you back uh, and open it up to questions from the audience. So people who are watching, feel free to start thinking about what you want to ask. But in terms of this idea that your personal experience is really epic and this especially over the past year where people are in isolation, but we're all contending with these monumental, massive traumas, right? So, you know, nearly, we're approaching 3 million people who've died uh, from COVID. Uh, people were feeling deeply isolated during quarantine and there was the effect on mental health. Uh, you have the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter uprising, and it's kind of coming back this week with the uh, with the trial of Derek Chauvin. Uh, you've got the issues of like rootlessness and the sacrifices that people make for work or income or what it means to be separated from your family, either by choice or by uh, or by necessity. Uh, I hear the, the echoes of Nijuma Hanum's paintings and the sort of haunting image of the eyes of, of the refugees. Uh, so with all of these really like massive themes that are all alluded to, how did you, as you're calling through many hours of interviews from, you know, from about 20 interviews, each one about a half hour long, how did you start identifying what the pieces of text and what the themes were that you're gonna put into the piece? Well, we go through a two part process. She does the first calling in a way. And and then I do the second one. So for you, I mean, we had identified um, different things, and I was I was kind of going through looking for um, stories of home and belonging, or there was um, stories of movement and walking, or swimming, or dancing. Um, there was uh, and we started to categorize what yeah. the kind of actions people are suggesting with their language. And then I think there was like you know in the the section called tonal talking. Um, which is the um, the movement where you hear all of the, the the stories that and a lot of the very profound ones that you're talking about, Bill. Um, for that section, like uh, was really to identify some of like those stories that were like at the heart of every interview, with yeah. the moment where someone. Um, every story, every interview had one yeah. great story to tell. Painful stories often, but one's one really solid brick of story that you didn't want to tear apart and make into lyrics. You're like, this is a complete action yeah um many many interviews also had more than one story but uh but there was like there's kind of um there's always like this maybe it's like an inflection point for someone in their in their story their own personal narrative or it's um and so those were kind of put into this um this section the tonal talking section and that was a way to address um both each each story as having such um an intense and inherent profound value and and um and then also the the overwhelm of all of the stories like even when you listed it bill there's a sense of overwhelm of this is happening and that is happening and this trauma and this is going on and it's all happening at the same time and it's all like and and we're and like our personal experience is a physical body in the center of it and like i think that skips masterfully composed that section to to embody that feeling yeah but and i think that in general coco is looking th looking through this to find the good stories the good language and whatever it's about and in general you start to say oh everyone's talking about this yeah. everyone's talking about immigration in australia everyone's talking about the environment in new york city everybody's talking about what it means to become a new yorker mm -hmm. so each region has similar things and right now immigration's at every place in the world how people move but then each place has its 
own individual issues. And then you go, okay, this is what they're talking about. And you start to pull out those stories and you start to say, okay, I'm going to use this language from this person talking about it and this language from this person talking about it. And then you have to use that instinctive uh, uh, pre-verbal instinct almost to start to pull the threads and tie them together and make what what's good lyric. Yeah, yeah. the kind of art in assemblage. Yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think what was interesting is one of the choices we made when we had to postpone the in person and we were like, do we go ahead or not? Yeah. Was we want to capture this moment in time and we don't know what we're going to do with it yet, but we want to capture it. And one of the one of the discoveries that I had, I think the first time that I listened was that you ended up writing an elegy, right? Like, and in a point where so many people have been lost in so many different ways uh, and people have not had that moment to mourn collectively. That to me was the driving emotion of this piece. And I know Skip, there are pieces kind of throughout your catalog that are elegies and Coco, I know that you've done a lot of your work in hospice care and thinking about issues of mortality has actually been uh, a through line in your work in a bunch of different ways. So yeah. that that was, I think, for me, a really profound feeling. I know one of our, our next guest, uh, I want to bring I want to bring her on because I know she's got some time constraints. So uh, we I think I want to I want to circle back to some of these parts of the conversation. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I want to now uh, bring onto the screen Tala Worrell, who was one of the people who were very generous to uh, share her experience and her stories with you. And I know that her words had a lot of impact on, the, uh, on the piece. She's a, uh, she's a visual artist and an Abu Dhabi native. So, uh, so if, uh, if we could bring up Tala, that would be fantastic. And it's not coming up on my screen there. There she is. Okay, good. I switched my screen. Now I can see everybody. Uh, and I think I, I have to thank Marriott for calling out the potential for technical disaster tonight <laughs> as I lost my as I lost my feed. Uh, Give a blessing. So, so Tala, welcome and thank you for being a part of this. Uh, thank you. Dad. And I and I wanna I wanna just uh, just ask you just to talk about the experience of being in the movement interviews. What are some of your impressions or some of the memories about what it was like? to both be sharing your kind of stories and responses in motion, but also, you know, one of the things that happens is each interview subject is also transcribing, witnessing somebody else's interview. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what it was like for you to be on those two sides of this process. Yeah, um, first off, thanks Phil, thanks Coco and Skip for, it was amazing to hear it for the, for the first time. Um, I was actually reflecting on this and talking to my roommate about it this morning because now it feels so long ago and that interview happened so quickly and it's a and it's kind of made me even think about like the lifetime or lifeline of a work of art you know and how long things can take and just you know it's expanded sort of what it could be for me um in the movement interviews i mean something that i noticed immediately is that coco has this incredible ability to sort of create a um, space where you feel safe to be vulnerable, like almost immediately. And that that translated over Zoom, which I found very, you know, interesting. Cause I think it's like in painting or in your own studio, you work hard to create that space to be vulnerable in front of yourself. But almost when there's somebody else there, you there's this feeling that they'll catch you or they're witnessing it. And there's something that um, made the process faster. Um, the, the individual that I was recording, I think was, it was amazing to see how um, movement plays a role in bodies that have different abilities and interact in spaces differently. And I think he spoke about swimming and his motions for swimming. And I thought that it was amazing to watch him speak, but also try to draw him speak and to like see how his like voice cadence or temperament would change as he was moving. I mean, of course, now I'm curious about like what I looked like in that moment. Um, but so those are those are some of my thoughts on 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 that experience. 
Can you actually explain what you mean about drawing him speaking and, and what, what that reference was? Because I think, yeah, I, we, there was a component of the um, uh, interview where I think the person that was not moving on screen was doing some sort of recording. And I had just chosen like in between maybe writing or something, I remember choosing to like draw his movements instead, which it, it was just one of those like intuitive things. Um, and and now now that you've heard it and heard the piece, uh, I'm curious. Do you recognize yourself in the piece? Not not only your specific words, but like in other people's words. God, what was your response as you're listening to it for the first time? I mean, my first response right off the bat was like it just felt like my world was created in the sense that like English was spoken in all of the different accents that I grew up interacting with the language of English in. And it's so rare that I hear in a piece of sound or a piece of music, you know, English that's like allowed to be left in the accent that it's spoken in by that person. And in that sense, it like, it really created a sense of place for me that was very much Abu Dhabi and my upbringing. Um, and I didn't even realize that that was an absence in sound or music or film, you know, any medium that is using sound. I never realized that that was missing from it until today. And of course, I mean, I had forgotten what I had said. And then I heard the section that I'm like, oh, without a doubt, that's me. <laughs> and of course, I saw myself reflected in other stories and then was very surprised about others. You know what I mean? Like there were perspectives from within the community that I had never heard before or just maybe had not had that conversation, which is of course amazing um, to hear. You know, you just never know what people are thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I think that that comment about the accents for me, when I try to explain kind of what it means to be in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and when we talk about this piece as a portrait of Abu Dhabi, I think that the all of those different cadences and all the different accents is so much part of the experience here. And I'm really happy to hear you reflect on that. Uh, I know you've got to go, but Skip and Coco, you're hearing at a you were both in the same room. I'm curious if, if you've got any questions for one another before before we let you go, Tala. I just want to say that, you know, I feel like if the gauntlet is successful at, as a form, it does things that we didn't intend. And but to hear that it that it's like it, it's the sound of Abu Dhabi as you're go growing up with the the accents. Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, speak in your own accent. I was like, yeah, speak in your own language. That's exciting. But I didn't understand what that meant. Yeah. That decision was made and that's humbling it's really humbling I, it's really thank it's really moving thank you i mean again like i just want to say that on like a very personal level that this has very much changed sort of my expectations of like what certain parts of my practice or what my work can do you know what i mean and like maybe even an emotional demand from people a durational demand from the things that i'm engaging with and like a certain level of sincerity. And so thank you both for uh, thank you thank so you. Much. allowing me to be a part of it and kind of learn through. You've through spoken such so great, with, at, at, you know, not all interview, not, not, not all interviewees are gonna speak in poetry and all the language works, but you actually spoke in poetry a few times. And we're yeah. like, oh, that's good. <laughs> you know, so. thank you. Yeah, and I know that your artistic process also has a, an embodied component where you really, um, you really, you know, use your movement. And we talked a lot in the interview about um, moving faster than the speed of our own judgment. And um, <laughs> I, I really thank you so much for yeah. participating. And um, I look forward to seeing what comes out of you what too. Comes next. Yeah, maybe maybe an in-person hang also when Bill, maybe it's yeah. perfect and all. That would be lovely. Yeah, yeah let's, let's yeah. do that. And I think it's also interesting that, that your practice, especially, I guess, more recently during COVID, has started to embody uh, portraiture as well. And so I, I really, I see that conversation as well. So and I want to say you coming. saying it's portraiture. I like, I never even thought of that until you said that. I'm like, oh, this is portraiture of community, of community, duh. Like I was like, until you said that just now, I never put that in my brain. So yeah. 100%. Well, Great. thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tala. I'm now going to invite the performers up. We're going a little bit through a little bit in the in the order in which we created the piece. And so now we want to go to the record the rehearsal and recording process and turning 
the interview process and the composing process into uh, into a musical piece. So I'm going to invite Claire Lesser, who is a lecturer in music here at NYU Abu Dhabi, and she's an incredible singer, particularly with contemporary music and the director of the NYU Indies Choral Ensemble. I also want to invite up two of her students who sang in the piece, Aliza Meek and Mohamed Albrecki, uh, and invite you all onto the screen. Uh, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to start with uh, Eliza and Mohammed for a moment, and just uh, ask you about first the experience. You couldn't you couldn't sing all in the same room, right? This is we're still living in under the shadow of COVID. Uh, all of your rehearsals were by section. Uh, this was the first time you're actually hearing the chorus that you're a part of. So I'm imagining what. Uh, what was it like to kind of hear this chorus for the for the first time? Um, okay, I can I think I can go in on this one. So for me, it was like a huge surprise, um, especially because as a biology major, I usually go by a very specific um, protocol. I know what I'm expecting. I know what I'm supposed to get. I know how the finalized product would look like. But with this specific piece, it was a total surprise. I don't think anybody knew from the beginning um, how everything would look like. And it was even more so uh, a very fun experience and a very interesting experience just uh, recording your individual piece. You had We had no idea what other people would sing. And even more so when we were um, practicing, we couldn't even hear the rest of the people within our own section. So it was really just like a very tiny little bit of the whole content that we, were, we could hear, which was our own um, uh, part. And uh, another thing that was like also very interesting was to indeed like even continue with the recording without the rest of the choir, which was quite a bit uh, intimidating. Um, and uh, trying to like make a part, like what kind of like feeling should you put in that specific piece? Where would this go? So like, um, uh, what, what is, what is uh, Skip really looking for in the specific piece? It was all like a roller coaster for us all to work together um, individually for such a complex piece altogether. Great, and Mohammed, what about you? What was, what was the experience like for you uh, hearing this for the first time? Honestly, from beginning to end, all I can say is that this was just so very surreal. So it's just from the beginning, just the idea of having the gauntlet and like what it was in the beginning, I was very confused about how it would play out like at least in the online way, you know? And then I realized that we'd basically be recording all of our parts individually. And that, and that recording session was again, the only word I can find is surreal because I'm in this huge hallway. There's the blue hall. I'm in this huge hall, you know? And I'm the only individual in it. And there's just one mic one laptop so I can confer with the others and then I have to perform. And that was such an insane experience because like I, I had the pleasure of like singing in this beautiful hall, but at the same time, it was just my voice reverberating around the world. And like the only other voice I could hear is for, through the headphones. And again, like while I was, after I finished uh, performing, I was just imagining like, how will it actually sound? like will my voice actually be harmonious well there was just so many questions but to then like listen to all of this and like i like this is music i, I like, we created music out of just these few parts and it, it it made me feel just really really proud of myself and proud of all of this and like everyone who was a part of this project that's great. Well, you, you absolutely should be. It was really, it's a gorgeous piece. Uh, and it's gorgeous in part because Claire Lesser, you gave such sensitive uh, instruction to the students as you were working with them. And I know Skip and I, after every rehearsal, 
he would send me these notes about how great you are with your students and about how much he, he loved being in the room. Uh, um, not often having a chance to be in the room for the process with the singers or meeting the singers before. And I know for you, a lot of your, a lot of your practice is contemporary music. You are often premiering work by leading composers that are writing for you, that are working with you. So I'm, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about uh, what it's like to in general work with, with the living composer and that collaboration with the artist, uh, and how that sort of translated to your work preparing the students for something that clearly none of us actually knew what this was going to be like. I think to Mohammed's point, we were all making this up as we went along. Uh, and so, Claire, I'm just going to remind you to unmute yourself, uh, and I would love to uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Um. Well, working with living composers, obviously, because they are all unique, every experience is utterly individual, not only in terms of the whole process, but literally minute to minute, second to second, day to day. Um, some composers are incredibly easy to work with and accommodating. And I have to say, Skip falls into that category. He's the <laughs> most accommodating and kindest composer I think we've worked with. And so very, very welcoming to the students. It was a pleasure having him sit in on loads of the rehearsals. And it was great that I could just say, hey, Skip, what do you want here? Um, have you thought of doing this in some instances? And he'd say, hey, Claire, would you think somebody could do something or other? It was really, really nice to be able to have that immediate back and forth, even though we're on different continents, all three of us, obviously, he's in the US, I'm in the UK, most of the choirs are in the UAE. So that was very interesting. It was nice for me acting, I don't know, kind of as a conduit, I suppose, because I'm actually more directing and facilitating, not performing myself. So it was very nice getting to do the, um, interaction two ways instead of it being all focused on myself or myself or my accompanist or ensemble or whoever I'm working with or working with a conductor or whatever in other professional work and it was great to see all the individuality that so many of the singers brought to the actual recordings because obviously zoom it's slow a great deal of it has to be done muted because you have to just get everything learnt. You have to get the material transmitted and learnt and so that the choir can repeat it and they can produce it. But then, of course, I mean, I know all their voices and it was lovely to hear the actual recording and saying, oh, yeah, there's Elisa, there's Mohammed, there's Casper, there's Vera, etc., etc. There's Lily, um, there's Nicole, and so on and so forth, which was great. But in the actual recordings, they brought so much to the um, interpretative experience, which I thought was great. And Skip really brought even more out of them because he was always giving them really good feedback, brainstorming, really, really great person to work with. And and I one of the things that I loved is after I, I got to sit into a couple of the rehearsals and I remember after one of them just sort of being a fly on the wall when you and Skip were talking about like each singer and the quality of the voice and that that individuality and the sort of the casting and the character of everybody's voice, which again, I think as, as you said in the beginning, Skip, uh, most, choirs, most choirs sort of kind of subsume that to the full choir and hear that individuality came forward. Uh, I, I'd, love to, yeah. I'd love to mention a, a, a great moment of that, which is when I was editing the voices and it's at the end of movement one of I Am A Foreigner. And I was listening to all this audio and Eliza was singing in this really strange, fragile voice. And I'm like, this is amazing. And I put it in the piece and I thought, she's singing so quietly, you don't hear it. I'm like, you know what I'm gonna do? Cause I had a feeling that the piece ended so, grand that it was too grand i took that little audio and put it at the end she's the last thing you hear i'm a foreigner wherever i uh, i'm a foreigner what is the lyrics yeah, wherever wherever i go 
And and what what I didn't realize is when she recorded that little bit, she had something in her throat and she was singing through it. Because right after there, after that, you hear Claire in the audio going, "Aliza, take a drink of water." <laughs> so it's nothing you do intentionally. And if you tried to fake it, it would sound fake. But it's that beautiful. Uh, uh, Coco always says uh, uh, she has this this term choreography of need. That, you know that things are most interesting when you're doing them because you just need to do them. Well, she really was trying to sing through this terrible thing in her throat and made this great vocal quality. So I, did you notice that in your singing? I did. And I was like, <laughs> I thought I had the better run of that part. But it was, <laughs> you did, you had a more clear run, but you didn't have a more interesting <laughs> run of that part. So yeah, you, you gave me something I couldn't ask for. And I think I, I remember actually writing to you, Skip about that moment of like, oh, that like that moment's really great. I hope that yeah, stays I in. Yeah. Uh, so I am I'm very cognizant of time, and we've got a few more speakers, and I want to open it up to questions from the audience. So I want to thank Aliza and thank Mohammed and Claire, you, and I want to bring up uh, Subin Thompson now, who is the sound designer for the piece, uh, and uh, and Subin is. Uh, he is both the, uh, he's a theater technical specialist for the Art Center, works with us all the time. Uh, it was really actually at some point when we were all struggling to figure out what are we gonna do with this, with this piece? Uh, we started looking at virtual reality and augmented reality and gaming. And then uh, Subin's working on another, another project for Tish that is using spatialized audio. And he and I were talking about that a little bit. And then the light bulbs went off a little bit and, uh, and he came on board as a, as a sound designer. Uh, he's also a composer in his own right. And I think that's important. So I wanna first start talking about the creative impulse of the sound design. And Subin, if you could talk about, uh, just talk about some of the conversations that you and Coco and Skip had about the intentions and about how you interpreted that and sort of your role creatively and how your own vision kind of came into this final piece. Thank you very much, Skip. Um, regarding the creative process, uh, I think uh, it all started with the concept of uh, of the real gauntlet, the actual gauntlet where the people, the choir is around you and the audience member is walking past and you hear these individual voices as Skip mentioned before. So because we can't do that right now, uh, we thought how about the listener stay still and the choir go past around you um, and and have uh, give the listener a treat so that is how it all started and then um it, it kind of evolved evolved uh, skip and i usually um, i mean we've told this many a times uh, this was not planned but it it was evolving and uh, the whisper storm it's it's one of the it's one of my favorite things you don't actually hear the whisper of like 20 people across your whispering into your ears swirling around your head uh, in a whisper whisper storm so um, that is something that uh, couldn't have happened in a real world scenario but there we are we are in a virtual world and uh, I think this gauntlet has evolved I should say. So talk to me then now about translating that. I think that that reversal was really key about instead of the uh, instead of the audience moving through it, that you would move the singers through in this uh, in this post-production form. Uh, and I think one of the things that's amazing about, you know, Choirs are one of the most elemental experiences of someone standing in the middle of a group of people singing. It's similar to, uh, we were talking last night, many of us around Theater for One, which is theater and storytelling. It's really elemental forms, but then technology is sort of underneath in a super invisible, but really intricate way. 
So I'm wondering if you could be a little bit of uh, Toto, I guess, or Dorothy. I think it was Toto who pulled the curtain away from the wizard and revealed some of the tricks that were behind. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about actually, how did you do this, right? What was happening in this program where you were able to hear singers all around you and above and below you? And, and what was that all about? Thanks to this wonderful, um, program called spat revolution by a company called uh, by a company called uh, flux immersive so this is spat revolution it's easier to show you so this is our listener and these are our singers so there's eliza casper vera shailina yasmina and they are all around you and uh, if I can start playing, this is I Am A Foreigner project, so there's Asel singing right in front of you. And the rest of the choir, so these are the people who are singing at the moment. So they are walking across walk and, and singing. And this wonderful program, I'm, I'm such a big fan of it. <laughs> um, so you can see that it's not just a 2D space, but it's a three-dimensional di space. So we have these ghost voices of Yasmina. She has got like one note um, singing, and there's and it's coming off like from a height, and some are coming from underneath the listener. So you get a kind of three-dimensional feel of uh, the voices around you and I think uh, that's it I'm gonna stop my sh screen share great I think what's what's so interesting as Skip said earlier about this idea of touching every bit of sound which I think felt like a metaphor earlier but then when you see the program uh, you actually start to sort of understand what that means and where all of those pieces of sound and it is about play it's about placing the voice in space and in time and in distance right yeah that's very true uh, i come from a live live sound engineering uh, background this was kind of very new approach to me because, but very intuitive. You just place the sound in the space around you, just like how a conductor would place an orchestra or like to get the best sound. So this was kind of like orchestrating um, voices and in the space. So it felt natural um, and uh, like Skip uh, said before, like he he was doing all the editing and and th these are like little plants that you plant in the garden, <laughs> and, and I'm so glad that I'm I was also a part of this gardening process. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's so beautiful. You really you grew a beautiful garden. And and Skip, I think there was some point where you started comparing this to I guess like the way that a bluegrass band would record, right? Around a conical. Oh speaker. well, I was I was yeah well well probably not even bluegrass bands, but but uh, when we were recording in mono uh, on on discs and early records, they just had a, a recording cone in the room. And it was attached to a needle and it would vibrate on as sound went into the cone, it would physically vibrate the needle on whatever they were recording onto. So if you wanted to do a band, you put the bass player closest to the cone, then the singer and then the piano player probably here and he percussion is way back in the room and you'd space people. So 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 the mix of instruments would be really good, all going physically through a cone to a needle. And this is like that, like there was no EQ back then and we we maybe once or twice slightly EQ'd something, but we you don't EQ in this space. You just place things where you want so it blends well together. In the same way, you'd if I was gonna 
uh, you had a bluegrass band live in a room, you don't EQ every instrument. You can't. They're playing live. Uh, it's like that. So it's all about placement in this virtual space rather than going, I'm going to cut out this frequency so the kick drum comes through. And like, so it's a very different, uh, it kind of, it's a contemporary recording process, but it harkens back to a, to the first recording process. Great. Well, it's a really beautiful job. Congratulations, Subin. Thank you for that. Uh, we are, uh, we're starting to get short on time. So I'm going to move to, we've got a couple of questions from the audience. So uh, the first one comes from uh, Mary, hopefully I'm not mispronouncing your name, who asks, uh, Copeland Skip, how did you determine the flow and sequence of the different parts and the different movements uh, and the length of the final composition. Uh, so what was the kind of, how did you take all of this different information and, and create a musical structure out of it? It's, it's very, it, it, it's based on the live gauntlets. Like it's, and it's, it's really good just to hear a normal, like a normal choral piece at the end, a unison sung thing. And we've always done it in unison, though this time we did in harmony. So I knew that would come at the end. Uh, you want the more experimental parts, which were the tonal talking in the middle, and you want something that is uh, that 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 is uh, fresh, but you can follow easily. Uh, and so we did. I am a foreigner, which has traditional melodies, but in the surround situation. Uh, so it's very actually very much like the gauntlets we did at Sydney Opera House and Rockefeller Center that that has has different formational movements. Yeah, there's a sense of like, I think the very, like the second gauntlet in Norway, um, I, it was cold, it was performed in December, and um, I had the idea um, to like give someone a warm hand and guide them through the gauntlet, mm -hmm. um, even if I had to put like hand warmers in my hands. And so uh, creating the piece, I think there's still a sense of like, how do you curate someone's experience? How do you take their hand yeah. and, and bring them through the experience? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, now, Lily has a question about uh, sort of about the creative processes. We've been doing a lot of arts chats with our Career Development Center about how do you continue the creative impulse in the midst of COVID and everything else that people are facing. And so she asks, how did you maintain the motivation to create this piece with so much happening every day? This this is probably unfair because it's not a good answer for everyone. But if I I have a creative impulse no matter what, which is why being an artist is my job. Uh, and that's it, like, I can't stop. So, and if there's a hole, then I'm a less functioning person. So it's my way of breathing uh, through the world. Yeah, but I think that there was a moment where I felt really grateful that we had put in the work for what this what this work was like it already had a sense of a formula with like yeah. the movement interviews and then how we did it we had already done the work to create like the the formula for creating the work and so when times were really hard and i was emotionally spent or mm -hmm. you know we also have a child who might wake up any moment like and it was <laughs> no. like when it was really like when i was exhausted i could lean back onto the form that i had already created that i I trusted worked and I like I love to mm. say this thing about the, the work that I make because there was one day when I realized you know mm. I want to make like I want to make like art and work that I love that loves me back and I think what I meant when I came up with that thought was like I want um, I want to be supported by the things I make as much as I have to kind of support and nurture the things I make and I felt that like there was definitely some times like um, Bill mentioned we started I think I realized we started I started the movement interviews um, about a week after George Floyd's death and so it's very um, powerful to me that um, the trial is going on right now as we premiere the piece and um, and there was a uh, there was a part of the experience of being in the US and then doing these movement mm. interviews with people in the UAE where um, like I was, I was so emotionally torn and, and, and spent and there was so much happening. And I leaned back into the forum and I, I listened and I, I did the movement interviews and I it gave, it, it gave me so much. Um, and so I, I hope that answers well, and I, I think for both of us, I could, I, when I came to New York and I met artists at first, anyway, I, I was like, wow, they're not doing art for the reason I'm doing art. I'm like, oh, why am I doing art? What I came up with for me is art is a tool for living, mm -hmm. meaning it's this tool. And, and you don't, you know, if you need to, if you need to put up a, a, 
a painting on the wall, a hammer is always a good tool. You could do it in other ways. You, you could freeze a pumpkin, and that's an interesting way to put a nail on the wall, but a hammer still is a really good tool. And I have that practicality. It's like, and for her, so I think what we're both saying in a way is for us, art's a tool that we use every single day. So it's not a question of being inspired to pick up the hammer. It's like, you're like, oh, I need to put the painting on the wall. I'm going to use the hammer. So it, 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 I think if you have a relationship with your art that's that practical, you don't need inspiration because it's, it's just like a fork or a knife or a hammer or a glass. It's something you would use to get through the day, to move through the day. Yeah, and I, th I think that that's one of the things I felt from the art center too. I think our, our immediate mode, my immediate mode was just to really kind of lean in because there's so much else. This is the thing that, this is what we do. This is the thing we can hold on to. And that can drive you through, sometimes allowing you to compartmentalize as much as you need. Sometimes yeah. I think in, in the period of this, actually allowing you to contend with all of the things that are actually happening and giving you a, a opportunity to process it. Uh, I think we've got time for, yeah, go ahead. I just go wanted ahead. to say like to that end, like also we weren't in a bubble. The art center was supporting us through yeah. the process and really helped like Bill and everyone at the art center was like, helping guide us through this process they did not let us drop the ball yeah. once they were an integral especially like part chris of it. and yeah. chris by like you know yeah and claire and yeah. uh and subin and Lindsay. like we we were not in a yeah. bubble making art we are we're in a community making art. yeah yeah no, that, that's a really great point um and i will encourage people if you haven't downloaded the program uh there's a reason why all these people are listed at the end of programs because there's so many people whose work and whose hands are involved in making this there were 20 people whose yeah. voices and whose words were part of it and there were the singers so uh so I do encourage you to download the program, read it, acknowledge all the people there. And I'm going to just ask one more question, uh, which is about all the people who are part of uh, uh, who are part of making it. And this is from uh, Smriti, who says a few of her friends' voices are in the piece, mm -hmm. and uh, and she was curious about the process for searching for the actual voices in the piece. So I know that they were all part of the NYUD choir but then you you had to sort of cast what text goes with what voice right so if you could talk a little bit about how you do that how you do that matchmaking and who's singing what and who's who's saying what story and i know that's sometimes really interesting genders and all those things yeah well you know it's interesting with an orchestra um you want to have different timbres you want to have like we want to have the nasally oboe and we want to have the soft open uh uh uh, uh french horn but with a but but there's consistency in each section because we know how to build an oboe and what it's going to sound like we know what a french horn is going to sound like we know what a kettle drum is going to sound like but with choirs each person's voice is so different that I, we don't go, okay, this is going to be the Tom Waits section and everybody's going to sing with a gravelly voice. And this is going to be the operatic section. And this is going to be the Appalachian section. Like we don't do that. And I've, and I've thought for a long time, what if we did do that? But voices are so different that it would be hard to create the consistency, though I still want to try this. But so what happens is you have two things. You want to have, you want to go, okay, this singer always sings in tune and always is really consistent. So I can go through and I pretty much know this singer is going to hit all their notes. But this singer, always, every time this singer speaks, it's so interesting. So I'm going to grab their voice. Or every time this singer sings, it's so interesting. So I'm going to push their voice forward in this section like we did with Eliza, um, because this, the, you're just going to listen. So it, it's, a, it's a balance of going, uh, what are the reliable sounds and what are the interesting sounds? And every single person made an interesting sound. There's one moment where, where every single singer shines. I can point, I'm like, oh, I use them here because they did this interesting thing. So in that way, it's kind of, it's more like filmmaking. You know, you shoot a scene, you shoot a scene and you're like, oh, the actor did this interesting thing here. So it's always what's consistency versus what's interesting. Sometimes they commingle and sometimes that you just grab, you know, the consistency or you grab the interesting aspect. Um, and for me, I mean, I have this sort of the, the rare experience of having done the movement interviews and knowing where the stories came from, who said them. Hmm. And um, and I try like sometimes when Skip asked me for my advice on who should say what, um, you know, I think about who who said the story initially. And sometimes I try to almost 
steer the opposite like if um if yeah. um uh you know and 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 it's and it's 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 really powerful to hear different people tell very personal stories from someone else and yeah. um um yeah i think um it, it is an instrument <laughs> yeah 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 and i think that 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 idea of the uh the intimacy and the personal nature of the stories but yet the universal the universality of them and the fact that that story can can move into somebody else's voice who's a different age who's from a different nationality who's a different gender uh can bring something else to it and i, I think well again, and i think that, that gauntlet as a form in it inherently demands empathy like to, yeah. especially when you're passing tones, you really have to listen. And even in this form, because we really had the longer stories and other people, it kind of like the form goes, I, I need you to listen with empathy and I need you to sing with empathy. Yeah, it's funny. So a, a, a friend of mine texted me during the performance and said, has Skip ever worked with Toshi Regan? Like they should be doing something. And, <laughs> as, and as you're talking expected. about empathy, uh, yeah. I'm thinking about that comment at about Parable and Sower, which is part of our art center origin myth. Uh, so I just want to thank you both. I want to thank Subin and Claire and all of the singers from the from the choir and all of the people who did the movement interviews and everybody at the art center. Uh, I'm so proud of this piece. I hope that everyone who listened tonight will go back and listen. If you listened in the dark in your room, I hope you take Coco's embodied listening suggestions and maybe go out and listen in a public space. Uh, listen at the gym, listen in a public plaza, go back and listen in your room, uh, listen in the bathtub, uh, make sure you don't have the electrical supply too close. Uh, but but do spend some time with it. I think uh, the piece is really, really rich and really rewards uh, delving into all of those layers. And thank you so much for uh, creating this for the Art Center for Abu Dhabi, for the UAE and for the world. Thank you. Thank you and so much. So much Bill. thanks to the Art Center. I, yeah. I was in the middle of this and everybody involved um, uh, Claire and Chris and Subin and Lana and Jen and Bernice and you um, and Lindsay, I felt like we got the ex we got lucky. We got the exact, but it's it's probably good initial curation for whatever you're doing as an art center in life. But I'm like, wow, we got the exact right people to pull this crazy thing off. Like, and I mean that deeply. It was it was a I I kept going. How did we get so lucky <laughs> to be able to get this group specific group of people? They're all pushing in the right places for this to happen. So thank you. Thank you, Phil. Great. Well, thank you both. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. We hope that we'll see you at Manifold New Sounds of 2021 on Monday and Theater for One from Wednesday through Sunday, uh, a week from now, uh, where you can be in an audience of one with the performer and have that same sense of intimacy. Uh, and have a great night. Good night. Take care.